Uh, a very warm welcome to you all. My name is Patrick Mpedzisi and I'm a co-founder of Nahari Africa and also a member of the BMW Responsible Leaders Network. Um, uh, this session is being held uh, during the BMW um, uh, Equity, Diversity and Belonging Week. Uh, the session itself will focus on whether uh, our leaders are guaranteeing the inclusion and well-being of Africa's youth. During this session, which um, is pre-recorded, um, you will be able to uh, give your comments on YouTube. But after the session, we will have um, a 45 minute reflection and engagement where I hope you will all be able to attend. Uh, so please um, uh, feel free to watch this video. And then uh, uh, if you have questions or submissions, keep them in mind. And after the video, we'll be able to share this together. Uh, thank you all again for attending. Let's start by testing your knowledge. Let's have a short quiz to see what you know about young people in Africa and the context in which they exist. The United Nations defines youth as individuals between the ages of blank and blank. Across Africa, nearly blank percent of a population is under 25 years old. In the next 30 years, what percentage of the world's population growth will happen in Africa? True or false? Youth and children are more instinctual and prone to impulsive decisions and choices than adults. And finally, according to the World Bank, youth account for blank percent of Africa's jobless. Let's see what the answers are. Unlike the African Union, which defines youth as people between the ages of 15 and 35, the United Nations defines youth as individuals between the ages of 14 and 20. Across Africa, nearly 70% of the population is under 25 years old. In the next 30 years, 50% of the world's population growth will happen in Africa. It's true youth and children are more instinctual and prone to impulsive decisions and choices than adults. And 60% of all Africa's jobless are youth. I hope you had a good time with the quiz. So as uh, has been well documented and some of you might be aware, Africa's population is growing rapidly and is expected to reach over 830 million by the year 2050. In many of the countries, youth who are regarded as being from the age of 15 to 35 by the African Youth Charter represent as much as 30% of the population. So while these numbers in economic terms uh, may be and uh, are also considered by many African leaders as a precursor to a demographic dividend, they also present a challenge or a risk uh, of a demographic crisis. Without strategic interventions, um, uh, that, that are required to guarantee uh, decent employment, education, health services, and civic participation. Um, <clears throat> the young people uh, may uh, not actually uh, convert to become a demographic dividend. Um, as you might know, uh, in 2017, the African Union declared the year of uh, harnessing the demographic dividend in response to the growth. However, this has uh, um, created alarm bells in many parts of the world um, where there is concern that the continent might not be able to take advantage of this dividend or is unable to respond to the growing number of youth. So in this conversation, we're going to hear from three panelists about their thoughts. Uh, firstly, um, one from private sector or the entrepreneurship angle. Another uh, panelist will be talking about how increased integration enables or is not en enabling uh, young people to reach their full potential. And we'll also hear how the international community or international corporation rather can support in enabling the uh, demographic uh, transition. Um, 
Uh, so the conversation itself takes a multi-sectoral approach on analyzing interventions for youth inclusion in African economies. It focuses on the question of whether leaders are responding to the aspirations of young people. We will now hear from Tandy Diani, who is the head of strategic partnerships at Girls Are Awesome, and spends her days uh, creating where she spends her days uh, creating collaborative efforts for gender equality uh, representation for a, uh, for a more equitable world. She is passionate about building communities, connecting people and organizations to solve the most wicked challenges uh, facing our communities and societies. Uh, she believes in radical collaboration responsible leadership, equity, and equality. Tandi always focused on development issues, gender equality, diversity, equity, and inclusion, enabling social entrepreneurs and ecosystems and connecting dots, people, and ideas. Uh, she was uh, formerly the CEO of Impact Hub in Johannesburg and has been a DJ for more than 20 years. Uh, uh, and she currently uh, splits her time between the Nordic countries and Sub-Saharan Africa. Hi, um, my name is Tandi Diani. I am Danish South African and I would like to answer the question whether the private sector and entrepreneurship is an inclusive space for youth in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think in the short, in a short answer, uh, it's yes. There is a lot of focus on youth and the demographics of our continent is predominantly young people and also on how we train, adapt and prepare youth for entering the job market. Um, also creating jobs and businesses themselves. But I think my interest really lies more around the focus area. Does it really create impact, this focus? Um, does the way that we've been building programs and interventions really work? And in my humble opinion, there's a lot of work to be done and the long answer would then be no. Um, and I would start really by flipping it upside down. In corporations, employability is a term kind of often used. And there's now a whole economy around the term employability of youth. And don't get me wrong, they do need training, basic personal and digital skills and other tools to make it in the job market. But employability has also become a term that's very non-inclusive. And it suggests that young people and youth in general needs to be shaped in a certain way before they can fit into the traditional kind of conservative corporations and land that first crucial job. Um, there is a certain degree of assimilation. And in my opinion, I think assimilation, well, it's really a term I don't appreciate too much. Um, there's a certain notion that um, the culture in which they need to be assimilated into is hierarchical. There's one culture that's better than the other. Um, so instead of creating these cultures of assimilation, um, I would rather go for a culture of belonging. So my question is, isn't it also time that corporations start building inclusive cultures, cultures of belonging, especially in societies where holding a decent job has been and is very much for pr the privileged few um, that's dictated by race, income, and social status. And for example, in South Africa, there's a whole, um, there's a whole structure around learners and how corporations can benefit from learners, learner positions where they get a little bag of money to integrate young people in these learner positions within between six and, and six months and a whole year. Um, but you can also find now that as one person would have six learners positions um, on their resume, but still not that crucial one job. So wouldn't it be appropriate to start building and iterating these kind of proper onboarding and training programs that really works for youth where they're at themselves and not where the private sector feels that the person should be at. So in entrepreneurship, I do see a great potential. Um, and it's quite common that there's a lot of young people in the startup ecosystems overall. Um, there is a real opportunity to create social innovation and create jobs, not only for yourself, but also for others, while actually solving local and community-based challenges. It holds the possibility of defining new ways of working and many governments put its fates on startup and SMEs for a thriving economy, but also the inclusion of youth into the workforce. 
but the funding of these startups and entrepreneurs doesn't really match the ambitions. Um, it needs to be much more risk willing. And that's not just a uh, sub-Saharan African issue, it's really a global issue. Lots of the funding now goes into creating and growing the ecosystem, which is great. Um, but it's kind of large system players such as the UNDP, the WFP and other UN agencies um, and their impact accelerators. And I'm sure if we looked at the impact of funding, very little would actually reach the young people um, inventing and running these startups and these interventions or these, in, these solutions for society. And likewise, there's much more investment opportunities for startup in the scaling phase, but we need to bridge the gap for early stage funding or else there will hardly be any kind of actual investment going into scaling readiness. Um, and of course, it can potentially be opening a can of worms around the intersection of investments um, to women-led businesses and then again, black women-led businesses where there's a whole set of new challenges with the inclusion of young women. But there is progress and there is a willingness to kind of create a culture of belonging within the private sector, but also the entrepreneurship ecosystems. And in my opinion, that's really where the most potential act to actually change something for the better in the long run. Um, thank you. Tandy raises um, some very pertinent questions in her input. And I'd just like us to take uh, a minute or two and reflect um, on what she says. And uh, I'll ask you to get a pen and paper or somewhere where you can write your thoughts um, in response to a number of questions, which I will guide you through over the next two to three minutes. I'd like to start it off by asking, what opportunities do you see from what she shared. I know some of you are still writing down all the opportunities you can think about, and some of you are already at the blank point and want to move on. And so let's go to the next question. What dilemmas did you identify in what she was sharing? Great, I hope you're having fun with this. And here's my final question. If somebody who had different beliefs from us was doing this, or if you do have a different belief from Tandy, what would you say about it? Do you think that the new move um, for private sector engagement and for social innovation in Africa is enabling young people to participate better? Or do you feel that there is quite some work still to be done? Um, we are now going to hear Luanda Pungosi, who is the program officer um, at the Southern uh, South African Institute of International Affairs, uh, based in Johannesburg. Uh, she is passionate about producing research that highlights the agency of youth. Uh, she holds a bachelor, a BA degree in political science um, from the University of Johannesburg, um, and she has also spent some time in uh, Shanghai in China. Uh, during 2017 uh, at the Summer Breaks program. Luanda is currently studying towards an honors degree in international politics at the University of South Africa. Her areas of research um, include BRICS, uh, South African Foreign Policy, Youth and Human Rights. Um, I came across Luanda when she was engaging with the African Union in relation to uh, what programs they have done 
uh, in relation to youth, but she also works very closely um, with the African Peer Review Mechanism, which is um, an African governance uh, program, where she looks at uh, the role, um, how youth are being engaged and how their issues are being perceived and uh, uh, acted upon in those reports. Um, Luanda. So Luanda, um, uh, from your perspective, from the research that you've gathered, um, how are Africa's young people uh, better able to participate in the social, economic, and political affairs of the continent um, due to the increased integration that is uh, happening? Thank you for that question, Patrick. I think as a point of departure, I would sort of have to try to interrogate what that increasing regional integration looks like, aside from the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, that is actually propelling us to that um, to that re aspect of regionalization. But, you know, there are so many barriers to this unity and integration that I have experienced as a young African. And that is in the lines of sort of the language. I mean, we are very rich and diverse continents. Um, so sometimes connecting with the different sub-regions where we don't share the same languages has become a bit of a barrier to this integration. Um, travel restrictions, and, and, and I think this is a major one for Africa's youth. If you live in the southern, um, in the southern or eastern parts of the continent, it's very difficult to be able to get into the western and the north and and so it goes so for me i really try to really try to unpack what does this regional integration mean in a very realistic way to really propel young people to actually move around the continent freely and integrate um, in those respects um, the policies they they're not very coherent from all the africa i mean we are a very big continent so you don't expect the one size fits all but for example if we're looking at a very prominent uh, normative framework for young people which is the african youth charter and you sort of try to look at the way in which this then uh, translated and domesticated at national levels, we are speaking very different languages as a continent. So if I'm speaking to a young person from the northern region, they have a very, very basic um, basic understanding and a basic interpretation of the African Youth Charter, where it's, 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 it tends to be more rights-based, whereas if you go to other more progressive uh, um, regions of the continent, it's more progressive where they've even gone as far as articulating youth charter policies to actually having young people at, at decisions of levels of decision making rather. So I, I think for me, the, the aspect of regional integration really, it does not sell at the moment. I see it as prominent specifically on young people. But basically uh, trying to then maybe unpack what use uh, participation and inclusion within the political, social, and economic processes entails. Perhaps let's start, start understanding where this conversation starts from. It starts at the regional level, at the African Union level, where we have the African Youth Charter that was adopted in 2006. Um, and we didn't really get a lot of signatures uh, from off the bat. But, you know, countries convened and they decided this was necessary and they decided to adopt this. But it took a couple of years to get a prominent number of countries as signatories to the African Youth Charter. But eventually we did get there and they decided that they want to have something called the Africa Decade Plan of Action. This is now tr translating this framework, this policy framework into a plan of action. Um, and Patrick, it is very unfortunate that it actually, we came to the end of that decade, it was probably 2016, if I'm not mistaken, and absolutely nothing had been done. So for me, that tells me that they, this was not demand driven, you know, it, the, the, this convening of youth frameworks and trying to integrate the, the youth work at African Union level, it was not demand driven by our heads of state. So there's something that was done because, you know, people were calling for it and there was a need for it. And of course, because of the demographics and how they were starting to look. Um, for me, in my assessment, it is only after the decade plan of action when young people really called out our leaders to say, you've done nothing, but they actually then started, you know, and it's also the regional, um, it's also the partners, the development partners who actually brought this into the agenda in a prominent way. And we then started seeing a bit of action in 2017 when they dedicated 2017 to the year of youth. Only then did we start only seeing the, the convening of platforms to actually uh, discuss and deliberate to youth issues in a meaningful way. I wouldn't really say entirely meaningful, but it was, it was something we could take. Um, and only then uh, I could 
assess that there was a bit of action at a regional level. Still, we are missing a lot of components at national levels. Uh, but from then on, we then had, um, we had the AGA uh, trying to convene young people at the high level dialogues. And that's what introduced the, the concept of intergenerational dialogue, having young people and old people together, speaking about pertinent issues. Because the misconception has been that young people are trying to take over and we're trying to deem older people uh, irrelevant but that wasn't the case and aga started showing this and then agenda 2063 was also another component because there was an aspiration that was dedicated to marginalized groups so then we are starting to sort of take this youth and marginalization quite seriously um meaningful youth participation at this point i don't i, I can't really affirmatively say that it was meaningful but it was you know we were getting somewhere young people were getting a seat at the table um at least from a political point of view and a policy point of view uh, on an economic aspect i think you know if you come from a country like south africa where youth unemployment is currently sitting at 55.7 percent and, and this is sort of a, an issue uh, around the continent i'm not exactly sure what we're doing to really ensure that young people are participating at an economic level and on sort of social issues i don't think governments have um can actually keep uh, young people out of those discussions because whether they like it or not these conversations are taking place they're starting in in platforms such as social media we engaged in issues such as corruption, poor governance in the continent. We are really in tune with what's happening from a social, socio-political and socio-economic perspective. But really getting into those conversations with our governments at regional and at national levels is another story altogether. But maybe just trying to finish the assessment of the African Union and what's happening at a regional level, I think then we started seeing a lot more countries taking up the concept of youth participation um, after the decade plan of action and when they dedicated 2017 to be the year of youth and then the agenda 2063 came on and then at the African Union um, Commission youth division level we started seeing sort of initiatives like uh, the, the, the APAYE where they're trying to empower young people in various ways of education and entrepreneurship and so forth and what for me was groundbreaking was actually the appointment of the African Union Youth Envoy. However, we seem to be backtracking as a continent because we had this, we had a lot of engagements by the Youth Envoy, the term ended, the Youth Envoy hasn't been replaced. So we sort of move forward in terms of getting the young people in, in, in the political and economic and social spaces. And then we sort of backtrack. And for me, that books, it, it goes back to, is this still demand driven or is it because of pressure? But my assessment uh, uh, has been that there's more work to be done in terms of integrating young people in, in, in participation and inclusion. But at the moment, I'm not understanding where we are going as a continent, especially if we're trying to push regional integration. Well, thank you. That's, um, that was quite an input. Um, just to find out a bit more in terms of, um, I think uh, you've been doing quite some work in terms of the African peer review mechanism where countries, uh, because as you mentioned, there's a lot happening at the regional level, but some of it's not uh, translating. Well, the bit that is happening at the regional level is not translating at the national level. And it's not clear whether this is demand driven. And since the integration process itself is an ongoing process, a lot of the policy making, a lot of the economic decisions are still being made at the national level. Uh, what are some of the lessons that you've picked up from the African peer review mechanism that highlight some of the levels of youth participation um, at the national level? Thank you very much, Patrick. I think that it's it, these are not complicated things that I think we are doing or picking up. I think most of them just really require a shift in attitude. Um, and I think it's that attitude that really relegates young people to manipulation or thinking that young people are wanting a seat at the table because they want to deem the older people irrelevant. I think it's it's just that, that mind shift from the older generation. And that's what we've sort of experienced from the African peer review mechanism where you would go to meetings. I remember Patrick going into a meeting, um, an APRM meeting, and I, upon registering, uh, the person who was helping with registration had to ask me three times if I was sure I'm attending that particular meeting. And for me, that was reflective of, you know, the, the times in which we were living and, and, and the processes of the APRM, which was really not inclusive of young people at all. To actually us now in 2021, being an integral part of the APRM, and APRM doesn't host a meeting without ensuring that young people are part of 
the panel, not just attending, but part of the panel. Um, uh, the APRM ensures that the country reviews now are starting to take in young people because these are processes that did not involve young people before. The APRM is trying to ensure now that we are not just speaking of young people and having them in engagements, but we are actually now cementing uh, youth participation and inclusion in our tools and our processes because it's a very it's a very highly technical uh, mechanism and instrument, and it requires a lot of you know meetings, but it also requires um, it it also uh, encompasses a lot of going into countries, undertaking reviews. Uh, making sure we're using the right processes, making sure we're using the questionnaires. And in those questionnaires, they are now looking at actually having youth as a cross-cutting issue. So for me, those are the obvious wins that we have seen in the APRM. And the work is, is not done until this is actually translated to the national structures, which is the national governing councils, because the APRM secretariat is just the secretariat, convenes and it assists. We actually need to see this now in the national structures. Are the focal points actually in their work, integrating young people and looking at youth-related policies and looking at youth as a cross-cutting issue? Are we actually seeing the NGC making sure that in the composition of that of that of that body that there are young people represented there and they're not just tokenized? they are full members of those of those structures so there's still a lot of work to do in the APRM but we actually have seen a shift from back then when I was being asked if I'm sure I'm attending that meeting to now where you can never attend an APRM meeting uh, and not see young people sitting at panel and informing and and then really participating in the level of the discussion yeah well my final question then is that um uh, because the APRM basically helps us to monitor the levels of governance at a national level and to also, um, and um, I think it was 2015 where they were also given the mandate to help the AU in monitoring the implementation of AU decisions. And as you pointed out, uh, out at the beginning, one of the key uh, policies framework at the continental level is the African Youth Charter. Um, has the APRM made it much more easier for us to implement the African Youth Charter, or has it shown that the African Charter, Youth Charter is actually not being implemented at all? Unfortunately, um, I don't think that the APRM has actually shown that, and perhaps um, this is because this agenda is something that has been fairly new to them and they're also still learning about what youth for, meaningful youth participation means but in my experience i don't think this is something they've pushed what they've pushed for however is for countries to ratify the charter but in terms of the quality of the charter and the policies at national levels i am not of the view that they have done that but actually this is an interesting question because it opens up the scope for the APRM to be able to do that especially as a governance instrument and my assessment of the country review review report, I remember in a previous uh, research uh, output that I had had, had uh, done, I looked at sort of the country review, uh, review reports for Kenya, Zambia, and I can't recall what the third country was. And I looked at the, um, uh, the areas where the review reports speak about youth, and it was entirely very shallow. They take a very rights based. I mean, their definition of youth participation is very expansive from the outset, but when you actually look at how they assess countries in this regard, it became a, a bit shallow. It takes a very rights-based approach that, uh, for example, Kenya is providing education and employment. It creates an enabling environment for young people to uh, be entrepreneurs, and this is just an example, but it doesn't go to the very, very important aspects of the charter which in my view is article 12 which really then dwells into the level at which young people are participating at social economic and uh, political levels so i think the aprm has a, a bit of a gap to fill in that respect because the what i saw from the review report was not very convincing uh but yeah i think this is a conversation we have started they are taking in our recommendations and i do think it's good for them to to approve Okay, so thank you very much, Yolanda. Um, unless you have any other final words or recommendations that you might give for such a process, um, we'd like to say thank you. Thank you, Patrick. I think my final word is everybody needs to know the African Youth Charter, everybody needs to read the African Youth Charter, and that's how we start holding governments accountable, and that's where we start seeing where people such as development partners can assist African youth. 
What an insightful conversation Patrick had with Luanda. And based on this, again, I want to invite us to do some reflection. So let's get that piece of paper and pen out and let's do some scribbling of what's happening, what's occurring for us at this moment. I'd like to start us off with one question here. What is emerging for you as you listen to Luanda, as you remember what Tandy said, what is emerging? What patterns are you starting to see? What connections can you make? How does this connect to what Tandy said? How does this connect to what you know from before? How does this connect to the kinds of questions that you brought to this class? And finally, what's your new learning? What's your new discovery? What one thing has surprised you today? I do look forward to hearing more about this when we have the discussion session after this. Thank you. We will now listen to Elizabeth Malova, who is also the co-founder of Nahari, uh, my co-founder. Um, she's a speaker, facilitator, and entrepreneur with 20 years experience in addressing complex challenges. Uh, she works uh, in cross-sectoral, uh, trans-professional, multi-stakeholder settings to enable people to make decisions, solve problems, exchange ideas and information, and learn. She has a strong experience in international cooperation, development cooperation, and private sector development. Um, she will provide her insights in terms of um, how the international, uh, international cooperation can uh, support or um, enhance um, uh, uh, programs towards uh, the demographic uh, dividend. Does international cooperation enhance the ability of young people in Africa to participate in social, economic, and political processes? My perspective is the jury is still out on that one. Let me give some context. Young people are important for economic growth and for social, technological, and economic innovation, but they face an increasingly hard time in Africa. By 2050, 60% of Africa's 2.2 billion people will be under 24 years old. Unfortunately, they belong in a population that is largely socially excluded. They operate at the margins of society. On the social front, they lack access to resources and services. They are exposed to violent crime and have limited access to justice. They find themselves faced with unfriendly policies. Economically, they lack access to employment and to markets. They have little to no share in economic growth, and they make little to no contribution to either household, community, or national well being. Many find themselves in a condition of perpetual weighthood. This has led to a number of protests the Arab Spring, the Balai Citoyen in Burkina Faso, Yen Amare in Senegal, the fees must fall in South Africa. Despite young people being the driving forces behind many of these political and social movements calling for democracy and social and political change, they are not perceived as a critical constituency by political leaders. In many African countries, the leadership is aging and has been in power for 25 years or more. In some countries, more than 80% of the population has never experienced a leadership change in their lifetime. In 2015, a quarter of the world's political conflicts took place in Africa. Young people were first the victims of conflicts, as well as a source of recruitment for organized crime and radical groups, such as those in Mali, Senegal, Somalia, and Nigeria. Exclusion from social and economic political activities leads young people to migrate. The bulk of the migration is within the continent but there's a growing number exploring the options of migrating to Europe. It is worth mentioning that while all young people are marginalized, some groups of young people are more excluded than others. This include young women, rural youth, young people from ethnic minorities, youth with disabilities, migrant youth, and the LGBTQI youth. 
A number of trends affect development in Africa and therefore the ability of young people to participate in social, political and economic processes. The US-China trade war, global increases in sovereign debt and the negative impact of the public health measures to contain the pandemic have all weakened prospects for economic growth around the world. Slower growth, along with more expensive credit globally, will likely harm African economies. Countries that have successfully diversified and transformed their economies and built up their reserves will be better prepared to weather any shocks. Unfortunately, this is not the case in most African nations. The breakdown in global trade governance as a result of a US-China trade war does not bode well for the World Trade Organization. The Bretton Woods institutions also find themselves facing an uncertain future in a world where nationalism is increasingly gaining ground over multilateralism. Criticism of these bodies has fallen under three broad areas, democratic governance, human rights, and the environment. The G20 has not fared any better and has become a less effective body with the legitimacy of its decision-making being questioned on the same grounds. In the face of weak governance and growth globally, Africa is looking inwards. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement was signed, ratified, and operationalized with deep regional integration expected to help transform the continent. At the same time, Britain, China, the United States, France, and the European Union have all launched initiatives to strengthen bilateral trade and investment relationships in Africa. Another trend to look at is Skills 4.0. Skills 4.0 is a logical extension of a concept of Industry 4.0 a world in which digital technologies help transform economies, societies, and democracies. Significant change is already underway in the new digital era, especially in countries where mobile penetration is high and internet access is growing. Seizing these opportunities depends on whether countries can efficiently support the development of appropriate skills in their workforces. Skills 4.0, such as those that can perform cognitive and routine tasks, will offer new opportunities for Africa's services exports and for wider economic transformation. There's an increasing recognition among policymakers and development agencies of the growing importance of and greater potential for youth participation and development practice. Many have adopted and adapted the three lens approach from the World Bank to youth participation, where young people are seen as a target group of development assistance beneficiaries, collaborators in development initiatives, partners, and initiators of development programs, leaders. This is based on their having agency, their capacity to act, their skills and capabilities, and their ability to change their own lives, and is the central tenet of the asset-based approach to youth participation. This framework is built on the recognition that youth participation in development, one, strengthens young people's abilities to meet their own subsistence needs. Two, prevents and reduces vulnerabilities to economic, political, and socially unstable environments. Three, promotes ownership and sustainability of interventions. And four, helps gain entry into target communities and build up trust and social capital. A couple of cases illustrate this. DFID Uganda commissioned a civil society organization, Restless Development Uganda, to lead and organize a two-day national youth consultation at the request of a national planning authority in June 2009. Young people's recommendations were listened to and clearly documented as part of a formulation of a national development plan in Uganda. In Senegal, the Population Council and Frontiers Together worked across different policy areas, utilizing a strong research base and government partnerships to catalyze change in adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights. Regional research pilots informed the creation of a nationwide program between 1999 and 2007. This was mainly funded by USID. There are still a number of criticisms. The rhetoric and action from the top neither trickles down to the community level nor creates impact at the scale needed to address the challenges young people face. In other words, a lot of money is being invested, but not much of it gets to the young people. And while the challenges of unemployment are growing, jobs are not being created, 
impact is there for not being achieved? Rural areas and the informal sector are typically overlooked. Many initiatives are centered around cities and in urban areas and are driving a large movement of young people from rural areas into urban areas, creating a growing population of urban poor. Social protection schemes are weak to inexistent. This means that young people remain vulnerable to economic shocks and find themselves in conditions where challenges such as the pandemic result in them falling back into poverty. Entrepreneurship and social innovation have been defined as the panacea to cure all changes. There is an increasing movement to adopt this to create opportunities for young people. As a friend of mine recently reminded me, we cannot entrepreneur ourselves out of bad policy. Finally, Africa is a vast continent. With 55 countries and over a billion citizens, the diversity on the continent is large. One approach will not fit all the needs. I thank you for your attention. I'm here finally with my final set of reflection exercises. So let's get that pen and paper back out and let's do some scribbling. You've now heard from Tandi, you've heard from Luanda, and you've heard from me on the different aspects of inclusion and participation of young people in social, political, and economic processes on the continent. Here are my questions. What is the next level of thinking that we need to do? What needs our immediate attention going forward? And how can we support each other in taking the next steps? So thank you everyone for attending and thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Tandy. Thank you, Luanda. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I hope uh, uh, everybody who was listening was able to uh, uh, get something useful from the, their perceptions. We are now going to cross over to the live session where we'll have reflections and uh, engagement. So for those who have questions or submissions that they would like to make, please join us for that session. As Nahari Africa, this is only the beginning of the journey. We are going to have a number of other sessions that we focus again on the issue of demographic transition. Next month, we'll be looking at uh, the role of parliamentarians in supporting and enabling environment for youth investment. And hopefully in months to come, we will also work with diplomats and others as we continue to unpack this issue. So thank you again for coming and uh, we'll see you in the reflection.